Our reading today from the Hebrew Scriptures is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 17 and verses 1 through 7. Listen to this, another story about water from the Scriptures. From the wilderness of Zin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They came to Rephidim and camped, but there was no water there for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people there thirsted for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children with thirst and our livestock? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They're already about to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there before you, in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a scary thing to be really thirsty, to be really, truly, dangerously thirsty. You honestly can't blame these people for not trusting this God of whom they've just heard a few weeks ago, and this Moses who just appeared out of nowhere and said, hey, I've got a better place for you guys to live, follow me. Moses is grumpy and a little scary too. You can't blame the people for not trusting. Moses has his brother Aaron there as the religious leader, but everyone knows Moses calls the shots. Then there's this God whose name is I am, but they're not allowed to say God's name. You cannot blame the people of Israel for being a little fearful when they come to a desert place and there's no water. Water is one of those things that you take for granted until you can't get it, and then you notice it like many of life's best things, I think. I can't blame these people for complaining when Moses tries to make them do what we call a dry camp. Without water, you can't wash, you can't cook, you can't live for more than a few days. You and I might be among those who are saying, why are we even here if we're just going to die of thirst? What's the purpose of all of this? What's this been about? The bigger question, which is at the end of the story, is this. Is God with us or not? And that is a question that you have asked, whether you've ever been that thirsty or not. Is God with us? Is God with me? Is there someone in control here? Is God with me or not? This God of yours, Moses, this this God you keep talking about, this God who supposedly has a special place for us on the other side of suffering, a new place on the far side of hardship, is this God really with us? Or has this all been a terrible mistake, a big mirage in the desert? This is what we all ask ourselves when we come to the thirsty place in life. And it's a fair question. And I don't think it hurts God's feelings. One little bit. Is God real? And if so, does God even care about me? Is God with me? What the people in the wilderness seem to forget is all the evidence of God's love that they've already seen since they began this journey. Memory and hope abide together. But thirst, thirst is something serious. 
Thirst is a scary thing. It's so far removed from most of our lives on a day-to-day basis, thirst, that we can't even imagine how terrible it would be to get stuck in a place with no water. On my sabbatical, I told myself, as some of you know, that I was going to hike the Standing Stone Trail, which passes 85 miles along ridge tops in the mountains of central Pennsylvania. Never mind that it was July and it was crazy hot. Never mind that it hadn't rained back there since early June or late May. Never mind that there's almost never any water on ridge tops. Anyway, I wasn't worried about that. I'm a seasoned backpacker, right? I wasn't worried about that. I had done short backpacking trips back there and it's truly beautiful. It's so gorgeous, I just wanted to go back. The views from the tops of those rocky peaks are unbelievable, looking off for many miles. Row after row of long wooded hills that look like motionless waves in the ocean, blue and green fading off into the distance. And the valleys in between are mostly Amish farmland, contour plowed with those waving sort of shaped Fields, winding green and yellow fields, scattered here and there with big stone barns and little colonial-looking villages, forests and rivers. I live for that kind of beauty. I love it. It does, does something for my soul. Geologists say that the Appalachians are the oldest mountains in the world. They actually used to be as tall as the Rockies, but millions and millions of years have eroded them into what they are today. And they say, too, that the mountains of the eastern U.S. are the same range that runs through Norway and Scotland and Morocco. Because Pangaea came. Well, Pangaea was the one continent that got separated by some great seismic drift that pulled the mountains apart. And it's a wonderful thing to walk in those mountains and to think that there are people in Morocco walking on the same mountains. Just think how old the world is. How many places any one place has been? Even the place beneath our feet. This was once another place, a primordial ocean full of wondrous beasts that became a vast marshland, which in time became the place where we drive our cars and go to work and sit on our porches and dream our dreams and live our lives, our really short lives, our very brief lives. Little imagining that beneath our basement floors, way, way down there, lie the remnants of a world too strange and too fearful to imagine. These were the kind of thoughts I expected to think out there on the Standing Stone Trail. It was going to be not just a backpacking trip, but a pilgrimage, a spiritual journey. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, I told myself. I had it all planned out with maps and with daily distances that I expected to go and backpacking campsites, backcountry sites where I would spend the night. What I did not count on was no water. There's always water, right? I parked my car in the woods close to State College. I spent most of the first day crossing over the first mountain up to the top and down the other side. It was called Broad Mountain. Then I got to the valley and I filled up my bottles at the ranger station in the restroom. And I started up the second mountain when I realized, you know, I haven't seen any water and I've got a long trip ahead of me. Two of these bottles I showed the kids were always enough for me in the past, but I bet I'm gonna need a lot more so that I can fill up on those rare occasions when I do encounter water. And so I did the only thing that any sensible person would do. I went back down the mountain and back up the other mountain and back down it and back to my car and drove into State College and bought four more bottles. Come on, you can laugh at that. (laughs) So that now I had six liters to haul up those mountains, 14 pounds of tap water that I got from the restroom at the ranger station. The views were fantastic. The views were truly amazing. They were everything I had hoped for, even if the leaves on the trees were tinged a little brown from the drought. And yet I was not thinking deep thoughts about God and life and the age of the world and the size of the skies. 
I was too preoccupied worrying about one of the things that I never worry about in life, water, water. It was hot and I had to ration it carefully. I was constantly thirsty. I drank four liters. On that second day on the trail and all the stream beds that I had seen were as dry as dust. Even the large creek that I knew that once flowed through that area was dry, not so much as a trickle. Finally, three days and 30 miles into the hike and after crossing countless dry little stream beds, I came across one brook, one tiny brook that was just a laughing and a gurgling with water, as if it did not know that there was a drought in the land. It was about two feet wide and three inches deep, but I wanted to lie down in it. And I splashed it all over myself just like they do on the cowboy movies. And I filled all six of my bottles with heavy water and I sat beside it and I drank until I thought I would be sick. And I considered just staying there because who knows when you're gonna find water again. But I couldn't because I still had 54 miles to go and I never saw another drop of water on that trail. It was so dry that I had to abort the mission and retreat to West Virginia to a place I know called Roaring Plains where it's always wet. Water, it's kind of like grace. You take it for granted until you can't find it. Water, it's one of those things that you think will always be enough of. And now, after long days of walking in the desert heat and sun, the people of Israel come to a place where there is no water. And they're scared. And they're right to be scared. Moses names the place Masa, which means test, and Meribah, which means strife. Because being in water, being without water makes people just a little bit crazy. Why did you bring us out of Egypt anyway? What are we doing out here? Did you bring us out here to die of thirst and to kill our children? What about this God of yours, Moses, who's supposed to be leading us? What about this God who leads us to a deadly place like this? You know, Moses, all the other kids have nice big shiny gods that you can see, that you can touch, that you can feel. Back in Egypt, they had Ra, and they had Isis, and they had Horus. And Horus had the body of a man and the head of an owl. An owl, Moses. An owl. What kind of head does your God have? You don't know. And why don't you know? Because you've never seen this God of yours. Nobody has seen this God of yours, Moses. The wilderness tribes, they have their gods made of stone and bronze. But this God whose name we're not even allowed to say, no one has ever seen this God. How do we know your God's real? How do we know your God is with us? We need to know. Because things are getting bad down here. Where's God? And that is always the question. When you come to the thirsty place. This God I've never seen. This God I have no real proof of, where is God? This God who has sometimes been depicted as an angry bearded old man, is God with me or not? If you are not asking that question today, you have asked it at some point. Or maybe you will ask it someday. And yet, even as they complain, the children of Israel dine daily on manna. When they wanted meat a few weeks ago, they got quail, a whole flock of quail in the wilderness. When they needed their freedom from slavery, they witnessed a host of miraculous plagues visited upon those Egyptians. There was even a plague of frogs. And if that won't make you a believer, then when Pharaoh had a change of heart and decided to take them back as slaves again and came chasing after them, According to the story, they witnessed the miracle at the Red Sea. And every day, God guides their way with a pillar of cloud and by day and a pillar of fire by night. It's not enough. When you're in the thirsty place, all you see is your need. All you see 
is your fear. How quickly they forget the many convincing proofs of God's presence and God's love. How rapidly they come to take all the good things for granted. I mean, really, why would this invisible God have sent the frogs and the manna and the quail and the cloud and the fire if God's only purpose was to lead them out into the wilderness and let them die of thirst? But you can't think like that when you're in the thirsty place. Maybe you just can't. There are times when all you know for sure is your need, your thirst. How many blessings and wonders and tokens of God's love are enough to convince us that God is indeed with us, even in the thirsty place? The God who brought you this far is the same, faithful, purposeful, near. Sometimes we have to look back over our shoulder and take stock of the wonders and the goodness that we have seen, and look around at the goodness that we still have in order to sense the fact that the God of the past is the God of today and of tomorrow. Memory and hope abide together. Is God among us or not? Is God with me or not? Is there even a God? If you're not asking that question today, then you can be sure that someone you know and love is asking it. And you have asked it, or will ask it at some point. We all have and we all will. It's not a bad question. I don't think it hurts God's feelings that we experience doubts. God's been around a long, long time and seen a lot of stuff. Besides, we don't like to admit this, but even Jesus from the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I don't think he said it for the camera. I think he said it because he really felt it. He said it right after he said, I'm thirsty. Is God with me? In the shifting sands of youth where you're not quite sure if you're still a kid or if you have to be an adult and you don't know how, or in the the dissatisfaction of middle age, is this all there is? Or in the unraveling of old age, the letting go? We all ask it. What's the plan here? Does somebody here have a plan? We need somebody with a plan. We need someone who knows what they're doing. It's okay to ask that from time to time because it's true that we can't see God. We can't touch God. A lot of very smart people dismiss all notions of God as some sort of glorified tooth fairy or Santa Claus. Or as one of the students in my confirmation class at my last church said, an imaginary friend for grown-ups. Does God know me? Does God walk with me? Does God care? As I've said many times, is there anyone behind the curtain? Because if I could just pull back that curtain for just a split second and lock eyes with whoever is back there, and if I could see some degree of kindness and wisdom in those eyes, I'd be good. I would go through suffering. I would endure hardship if I knew there was someone back there who kind of knew what they were doing, that there was someone at the helm of the world. That would be nice. I can't deny it. But instead of a visible God, which is always an idol, we get daily manna. We get the wonder and the joy of human love. We get the warmth and affection of our pets. We get the beauty of the mountains and the spirits within us to thrill at that beauty. Instead of a visible God, if we're paying attention, we get to see a joyful mystery moving through each day of our lives in laughter and in tears and in boredom, in silence and in words, in community and in solitude. Is this not God's life moving in us? We get to look back at our own lives and see traces of something that might almost look like a plan coming together. The problem is most of us never take enough silent moments to do that. All the seeming coincidences that have made us into who we are, all the pain that ended up resulting in something good, the wrong turns and poor decisions that ended up making all the difference, 
Just parenthetically, I would say that this is why we need to be quiet sometimes and put away our phones and stop talking. This is why we need to pray sometimes or even just sit still with our thoughts because when we pause to reflect upon our own lives, we sometimes see the mystery running through them. We sometimes see that we've been led, that we've been held, that we've been known, that we've been loved. You have been led. God didn't lead you this far to let you die of thirst. Memory and hope abide together. You know, Bower Hill, we are technically a Presbyterian church. I don't think that identity means a whole lot to most people in the pews. We have people in this church from many different backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and we try to honor the good in all of those. And so when Session and the worship committee decided that, why do we not have an affirmation of faith in this church? You know how most churches will stand and say the creed every Sunday. Why have we never done that here except when we receive new members and when we do baptisms? They said, let's go back to doing that. Let's have an affirmation of faith, but let's concentrate on more up-to-date ones. We'll use the Apostles' Creed sometimes, but let's concentrate largely on modern affirmations of faith with modern language and relevant words because we just tell the story of our faith. Sometimes you don't always know or understand or believe everything in the creed, but it's the story of our faith. And we'll be starting that today after the sermon. I hope you find it meaningful, but honestly, no creed, no affirmation of faith, no statement of faith has ever really convinced anyone. The thing that convinces us is our own experience. The things we've lived through, the things we've seen, the convincing thing for humans is our experience. And indeed, we have each of us known God's presence and God's love and God's grace. But it's possible that we have called those things by other names. Or we've rushed on to the next thing without really taking note. What will it take to convince us that God is with us? We have to name grace. We have to identify it. We have to recognize it. We must name the grace that gives our lives meaning and joy from day to day. It's not usually anything fancy. It's a thirsty world today. I saw an ad recently. You've probably seen it. I thought it was great. One guy asks the other, what do you want? The second guy says, I want a job I don't hate. I want to do something that matters, but I, I don't know what that thing is. I want someone to tell me exactly what to do. I want to stop feeling like if I take one more step, I'm going to fall into a pit forever. And the first guy interrupts and says, I mean, what do you want to eat? <laughs> it's an advertisement for online therapists. My thoughts return often to that little stream that bubbled and sang so happily in a parched and scorched place. While well, even just maybe 50 feet away, another little stream bed sat there dry as ashes. You know, even just the sound of running water in a dry place is a joy. Why did one brook still flow while all the others were dry? It felt like magic. Of course it wasn't. It must have drawn from some very deep sources. It must have been tapped into something that the others were not tapped into. Of course, we are always called into the future. We are always called forward. We are not called into the past. But it's helpful still for us to dwell on the blessings that we have known, to draw courage and hope from the goodness that God has shown us down through our lives. And that gives us strength for the journey ahead. By doing that, we receive the assurance that even though we've never seen God, even though we may sometimes doubt, we have in some real sense known God's presence, God's guidance, God's love. By dwelling on God's goodness to us, by naming it, we too draw from deep sources. It is a thirsty world around us today, and thirst makes people a little crazy. 
Our spirits sometimes find themselves in thirsty seasons too. And some people seem to live in deserts of the soul. Maybe you find yourself today at that waterless place, Massa, Meribah. No matter where you find yourself, take a good look at your life, its blessings, its joys, its happy coincidences, if indeed they were coincidences, its relationships, its loves. God has walked with you. God has guided you. God did not bring you this far in order to abandon you. Look around you, and you will see evidence of God's love. Memory and hope abide together. Amen.